Finn de Saclay Vienna, the city of Franz Joseph Sigmund Freud and a statistically unlikely number of future dictators, was the site of many developments in culture and the arts, as we have seen in our last few videos where we looked at two of the era's luminary painters, Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. Before we leave Vienna behind for new and ever more war-torn pastures though, there is one more artist of the time I'd like to discuss, the third in our triumvirate of turn of the century Viennese painters, Oskar Kokoschka whose various multidisciplinary works, like those of Klimt and Schiele, would have a major impact on the course of modern art. Quite unlike Klimt and Schiele, however, he was also, to put it politely, completely bloody mental. A painter, a poet, a playwright and an educator, Kokoschka was a self-declared wild man who would proudly identify himself as a degenerate and who seemed almost compelled to upset the bourgeois sensibilities of the new modern era. Whether he was consuming raw flesh at fancy Berlin balls or creating ritualistic effigies of former lovers, Kokoschka was a new kind of artist who knew how to make a scene. He was also, on a much less sensationalist note, a pivotal figure in Viennese art and the history of Expressionism, who professed a distinctive vision of art born from a merging of internal and external realities. A vision which he would champion all the way from the Vienna of Freud and Joseph to the ends of the 20th century and the world of Reagan and Thatcher. In his book, Fin de Saclay Vienna, Politics and Culture, Karl E. Skorske relates a tale of Kokoschka's childhood which illustrates his iconoclastic personality, so different from that of either Klimt or Schiele, and which foreshadows much of Kokoschka's artistic career to come. Skorske tells us that having learned in school of two inventions that had shaped the modern era, the printing press and gunpowder, young Oscar decided that the printing press, responsible for the textbooks he hated so, was of no interest to him. But gunpowder, now that was a different story. Curious and inquisitive to a fault, the young Kokoschka soon managed to whip up a batch of his very own, which he decided to test at a park near his house. Populated by austere historic statues and only slightly less austere bourgeois citizens enjoying the afternoon sun while their children played, this park seemed to Oscar the perfect place to test his improvised explosive device, which he planted in an anthill under a tree. Lighting the fuse and retreating to what he thought was a safe distance, he was greeted moments later by a deafening blast, clouds of smoke and a rain of flaming ants, which instigated chaos, shattering the afternoon peace and sending the park's inhabitants running for what they must have assumed was their lives. Quickly identified as the culprit, Oscar was barred from the park. This expulsion from the garden, as Skorske biblically frames it, sets the tone for much of Kokoschka's career, where transgression, expulsion and upsetting the general public would become semi-regular occurrences. Kokoschka's, let's call it, healthy disrespect for the values and norms of his day were very much a result of the times he lived in, which were themselves as explosive and disruptive to society as his gunpowder plot had been to tea time at the park, particularly in his native Vienna, which was a focal point of much of the change that would shape the century to come. Modernism, as we have come to call it now, hit the city like an earthquake, upending old social orders and seeding many new ones. Driven by technology and industry, as they advanced towards seemingly inevitable conclusions and informed by the new understandings of the human mind put forth by the likes of Freud, modernism upended our understandings of everything from politics and culture to sex and death and even what it meant to be human in the first place, all while a sense of creeping alienation emerged in the increasingly populated cities and the seeds of wars on a hitherto unseen scale took root below. The Vienna Secession had emerged in the midst of all this change, a new movement which broke with the city's entrenched artistic traditions in favour of a more sensuous, decorative and modern style. Under the leadership of Gustav Klimt, the secession had achieved great success, supplanting the historic styles that had once dominated Vienna's cultural landscape to such an extent that even the academies, once bastions of artistic tradition, now expounded the virtues of the secession's eminently marketable style. As was the case in the Kunstgewerbeschule, the school Klimt himself had once attended and to which Kokoschka would gain entry in 1904. He did quite well at the school, studying painting, drawing, craft and design in the now ascendant secessionist manner. He even gained a position as a tutor, the first of many teaching gigs throughout his life which paid him a small stipend while he studied, and employment with the Wiener Werkstatt, an artist co-op set up by secession members Coleman Moser and Josef Hoffmann to produce stylish modern works for market. It was there, under commission from the co-op's patron, Fritz Warndorfer, that he would create the first of many works that would gain him both recognition and notoriety. Warndorfer, you see, asked Kokoschka to create a series of illustrations for a children's book, a seemingly innocent enough request that would end in some less than innocent results. 
The illustrations Kakashka provided for the work, which he titled The Dreaming Boys, were by any standards quite beautiful. Combining the Secession's decorative approach with elements of traditional folk art, they weave a colourful and distinctive world with such style that they would enchant readers of any age. The problem, however, was not with the style, but with the story itself. Not being mad on the narrative he'd been given, you see, Kakashka decided to substitute it for one of his own, a tale based on a poem he had written the previous year which dealt with perhaps one of the worst possible themes ever conceived of for a children's book, namely, the sexual awakening of adolescence. This narrative, partly autobiographical and supposedly inspired by a relationship with a classmate of his youth, was, as you might expect, deeply inappropriate for its intended audience. To quote Kakashka, Red fishling, fishling red, with a triple-bladed knife I stab you dead. With my fingers rend you in two, that there may be an end to this soundless circling. Not exactly the hungry caterpillar, is it? Sex and the understanding of it is central to this work, as it was to so much of Vienna's culture at the time, evident from Klimt and Schiele to Freud himself. Picking up on these feelings of the modern moment, Kokoschka explores them using the highly personal first-person tense, in conjunction with images that depict the complex sexual psychology of both himself and his era. Though, obviously, this psychologically complex examination of a young man's unsublimated sexuality wasn't quite what Warren Dorfer had wanted, and it unsurprisingly wasn't that appealing to many others either, which resulted in very few of the 500 or so copies produced being sold. Although one person who did like it was Klimt, who enjoyed it so much he declared Kokoschka to be one of his generation's greatest talents, and as he had with Sheila before, he took the young artist under his wing. Klimt invited Kokoschka to participate in the following year's Kunstschau exhibition, where he showed a tapestry, now unfortunately lost, that is said to have dealt with many similar themes to what was most likely a much more appreciative and appropriate audience. This incident was enough to start gaining Kakashka some notoriety, but it wasn't until the following year that he would really start making a name for himself with the staging of his play Murderer, Hope of a Woman, which, like the Dreaming Boys, deals with the subject of sexuality, though this time in a much more aggressive manner, which approached the delicate politics of the sexes with all the subtlety of an articulated truck. Based loosely, very loosely, on the work Penthesilia by the German poet Heinrich Kleist, which portrays the mythical conflict between the titular Amazonian queen and the hero Achilles, in Kokoschka's version, the trappings of mythology and just about everything else are torn away. Instead of Penthesilia and Achilles, we get woman and man as our protagonists, and their relationship is one that in the Freudian sense is very much a mix of sex and death. Set entirely in the liminal space of night, the play sees man, followed by his band of soldiers, meet woman and her retainers, whereupon man brands woman with his mark, and she retaliates by stabbing and imprisoning him. Unfortunately for woman, a mix of love and hate takes hold in her, and she releases her assailant from captivity, only for man, who is himself near death, to reach out and kill her with a single touch. It was apparently about as nasty and brutal as it sounds, and the illustrations Kokoschka made for the play, which were published in the journal Der Sturm, have a similar bare, brutal character, which were distinctly non-secessionist in their style, signalling Kokoschka's growing restlessness with the limits of their decorative approach, which he increasingly found inadequate for expressing the ideas he wished to convey. Instead, every part of this work, even the stage directions, convey a primal, aggressive, unadorned quality. The man, white face, blue armour, head bandage covering a wound. The woman appears in contrasting primary colour, red clothing, open yellow hairs, large, loud. The play was performed in the Garden of the Kunstschau for an audience that was used to a more refined sort of show, so naturally the inherent brutality and sadomasochism of Kokoschka's efforts were not very well received. According to him, the opening night was greeted with riots and ended with soldiers storming the stage to put an end to the perverse spectacle. Though experts such as art historian Peter Vergo question whether this ever happened at all, thinking it was instead perhaps a case of Kokoschka telling tall tales about his escapades, as he was often known to do. One thing that is for certain, the transgressive play did cost Kokoschka his stipend, his secessionist support, and caused him to be expelled from his studies at the school. This expulsion was not the end for him though, but just the beginning as it brought him to the attention of one Adolf Luce, an architect perhaps best described as a frenemy of the secessionists for his opposition to their decorative, and in his eyes frivolous, style. Luce's own work was characterised by his minimal, non-decorative sensibilities. His buildings pride function over form and were designed to provide maximal utility with minimal fuss. 
His minimalist mindset was, in its own way, as revolutionary as the secession had been. Though not everyone at the time was a fan. Franz Joseph, for example, supposedly said that the house loose designed across the road from the Hofsburg Palace was the most god-awful, ugly thing he had ever seen, and after its construction, legend has it that the Emperor refused to leave the palace by the front gate, lest he have to lay eyes on the bloody thing. Besides designing buildings that earned him the Emperor's ire, Luce's other famous contribution to the culture of the era is his essay, Ornamentation and Crime, which, as many have said, could just as easily be called Ornamentation is Crime, in which he argues against the decorative in favour of a more functional approach, offering a call for simplicity which he takes quite seriously, going so far as to equate the decorative with a kind of moral failing and even degeneracy. As Luce himself puts it, the evolution of culture marches with the elimination of ornament from useful objects. It's interesting, insightful, and at times ridiculous stuff. He's so suspicious of decoration that at one point he even claims that anyone with a tattoo must by necessity be a criminal, and if they are not, it is simply because they have not yet had the chance to commit some violent crime. This kind of reasoning, coupled with some rather unsavoury behaviours later in life, Mark Luce as a bit of a controversial figure, but his railing against decoration and his minimal ergonomic style do represent a real advance for the modern arts, and one of the first true clean breaks with the artistic conventions of the past in favour of something new. Luce saw in Kokoschka a kindred spirit of sorts, someone who was similarly unfulfilled by the secession's ostentatious decoration and whose works were seeking a function of their own, painting not as mere decoration, but as a way to articulate the spirit of the modern era itself. Thus, Luce took Kokoschka under his wing, fulfilling the role of mentor that Klimt had for a brief time played, championing the young painter's cause and garnering him lucrative commissions from the wealthy circles in which the architect moved. For Kokoschka, this was a golden opportunity to not only make connections to replace those he had lost in the secession, but also to tackle the depiction of the human figure as Klimt and Sheila had done before him, though he would do so in a way that was quite distinct from either of them. Traditionally, to paint a portrait, the sitter would pose for long periods in close to perfect stillness while the artist worked to capture their likeness, methods that even modern painters like Klimt and Sheila still utilised. Not so for Kokoschka. He would engage his subjects in conversation while he worked. He encouraged them to get up and move around, to go about their business and partake in their daily activities, all while he paid close attention, recording the most intimate and pertinent details of their personalities and body language. This rather counterintuitive method of portraiture, a method he sometimes humorously referred to as his psychological can opener, was devised by him as a way of getting to know his subjects and, crucially, overcoming what he described as a sense of alienation he felt in many of them. This approach, while unusual, is in its own way quite intuitive. A person is not a still life, as Kokoschka would say. Life is born in motion and change, and thus to capture the real sense of a person, not just their superficial appearance, they must be seen in a kind of motion themselves. The resulting works can be as strange as you might imagine. His portrait of the writer Peter Altenberg, for example, which was painted hurriedly in between the writer's daily drinking sessions, would put even Sheila's more monstrous works to shame, as many at the time noted, including Franz Joseph, who was once again not a fan saying after seeing these works that someone should break every bone in Kokoschka's body. Jesus, steady on there, Franz. Despite this somewhat mixed reception, though, Kokoschka always painted safe in the knowledge that if his subjects wouldn't pay for the final result, then Luce most certainly would. One of the best examples of these portraits, and one the sitters themselves were quite pleased with, is this double portrait of the art historians Hans and Erika Tietze, who are shown in what appears to be a conversation, though neither meets the other's gaze. This is because both were painted separately as they moved about their home. Kokoschka encouraged them to talk with him and go about their business as he worked. According to Erika, they were generally positioned in front of a large window, though it's notable that the light in the scene emanates not from behind, but from within the figures themselves, who stand as islands of relative calm amidst a sea of electric colours, into which Kokoschka scratched energetic lines and cross-hatching with his fingernails adding a sense of immediacy, which was further stressed, as Erica recalls, by him abandoning his brush altogether and painting with his fingers instead. The image of the couple this creates evokes a complex conversation conveyed by the energy of the colour and latticework of lines, that nonetheless remains lucid thanks to the figures of the couple themselves, who are treated with the utmost care in terms of their position, body language and expressions, which convey who these people are, not just what they look like. His psychological can-opener at work. 
Their hands, always so important to portraits of the era for their expressive qualities, which form an implied bridge between the two, are perhaps the best example of this delicate handling, if you will pardon the pun. They link the figures, without allowing them to touch, thus preserving their independence as individuals while also linking them as a couple. These portraits are quite well regarded now for how well they expose his subject's inner sense of self, no mean feat in any era, let alone famously repressive Vienna. Distinct from Klimt, who had flattered and fawned, or Sheila, who had play-acted and postured, Kokoschka's renditions of the human form show a real attempt to document, describe, and even overcome the alienation inherent to the modern moment. Feelings of the era, which may well be most evident in the painting he made of Luz himself. A pensive portrait conveying a man full of tension, a rational being lost in the black void of an irrational world. His interlocked hands and tense expression signalling a raging inner storm held together by an ironclad will. While it might not be the most flattering picture, Luce, for his part, loved it, saying it was more like him than he was himself. Now, before we go on, there is one more thing about these portraits, and indeed much of Kokoschka's works, that we must mention. And that is how expressive they tend to be. Expressive of their subjects and their emotional character, of the artist's own thoughts and feelings, and of the changing times themselves that required an outlet to be expressed through. Expressive, as in the subset of modern art, that is generally termed expressionism. Expressionists dispensed with the appearance of reality, the artifice of the academies, and the ornate decoration of the secession, favouring instead the raw, unfiltered sensations of emotion that could only be produced by uninhibited paint on canvas. Expressionist paintings were generally raw, terse, ugly, and thus uniquely effective at conveying the complex new realities of the 20th century. By lashing on the paint, using discordant colours and deliberately unrefined compositions, they were able to evoke the similarly discordant tone of the new era itself. Now, the reason I haven't been mentioning any of this expressionist stuff up till now is because Kokoschka, despite being cited as one of the style's leading luminaries, despite being identified by art historians as a pivotal figure in expressionism's history, despite murderer, hope of a woman often being pinpointed as the origin of expressionist theatre, when asked if he was indeed an expressionist, would deny the allegation into the ground. Now the chap is entitled to his own opinion, but if you ask me, that's quite a lot of evidence that he was indeed a bloody expressionist. Enough so, that if we were to put him on trial for the hypothetical crime of being an expressionist, I'm fairly certain we could convict him. On top of all that, I'm going to add one more piece of damning evidence, a lecture he gave in 1912 titled On the Nature of Visions, which lays out the finer points of the theories underlying his works, which would itself go on to be a fundamental text in the development of the Expressionist style. Now, in fairness, this lecture has more to do with earlier strains of Expressionism around Vienna than the style overall. It was given before the First World War, when people had a little bit more faith in humanity and our ability not to butcher each other en masse over some vaguely stupid idiocy involving archdukes, faith that after the war was very much in short supply, and which would greatly influence later Expressionist artists. As such, On the Nature of Visions is in places quite positive about our chances of breaking free from the orders and hierarchies of old and establishing a new basis for art, one that is predicated on what Kokoschka terms the vision. The vision is an interesting mix of concepts and ideas that he cites as the source of his works. These include optical stimulus, his observations of the outside world through his painting, as well as internal subjective feelings and ideas that these observations generate. It is also, in the style of Freud, produced by a mix of conscious and unconscious thoughts, which the artist must interpret carefully in order to seize upon what Kokoschka calls the semblance of things, the images of the world that show us something of their subject's soul. The vision, or Geist, to use the all-important original German term that carries connotations of differing faces we may present or perceive, is for Kokoschka the source of his works, though defining it exactly can be a little bit tricky, as he points out in this gem of a disclaimer saying exactly what it's not. The state of awareness of visions is not one in which we are either remembering or perceiving. It is, rather, a level of consciousness at which we experience visions within ourselves. This experience cannot be fixed, for the vision is moving, an impression growing and becoming visual, imparting a power to the mind. It can be evoked, but never defined. Yet the awareness of such imagery is a part of living. It is life selecting from the forms which flow towards it, or refraining, at will. 
Now, a lot of this text focuses on, as you might have guessed, the nature of the vision and its relationship to consciousness, with Kakoshka claiming that consciousness is, in his terms, a sea ringed about by visions. He even gets pretty out there, imploring us to release control and reject arbitrary distinctions such as you and me in order to feel the soul as a reverberation of the universe and the vision as its plastic embodiment. It's some pretty heady stuff, at times sounding like something Terence McKenna would come out with at the tail end of a prodigious hallucinogenic bender, though most of it can be interpreted quite straightforwardly as a call to reject the stifling conventions traditionally imposed on culture at the time, be they historical or even those of the secession. What is most interesting about this whole spiel, however, is not what he calls for us to reject, but what he wants us to hold on to instead. For unlike most of the other writings on art from this period, Kokoschka does not want us to abandon the representation of the external world in favour of the internal subjective one. He wants us instead to use both. Other formative expressionist texts, such as the writings of Kandinsky or Wilhelm Waringer's Abstraction and Empathy, often presume the primacy of the internal subjective approach over the recording of physical reality, and what's more, they usually regarded both of these approaches as being in conflict. One cannot represent the internal world, they say, if preoccupied with mimicking the appearance of the outer. Kokoschka, however, disagrees, as his conception of the vision, which relies upon the synthesis of both external and internal realities without hierarchy, requires both of these methods to work, as the vision cannot emerge from within without the stimulus of the external world. This is perhaps the key difference between Kokoschka's view of art and just about everyone else in the 20th century. And while the rest of the art world would move away from representing the external world, he would remain stubbornly connected to it. For a man who had just implored us to release control, letting go of things was certainly something that Kokoschka seemed to have trouble with, though, as we can see in the case of his famously stormy relationship with one Alma Mahler, the widow of the composer Gustav Mahler, which is perhaps the most illustrative case of this, and by illustrative I mean borderline insane. Alma was several years his senior, and among many other things, a prominent socialite who hosted parties and balls frequented by many of Vienna's cultural elite. She had a keen interest in art and painters, having once been acquainted with Gustav Klimt in her youth, and upon meeting the ever-eccentric Oscar, the two soon became lovers. Head over heels for her, Kokoschka devoted much of his energies to their relationship, though Alma had her fair share of other admirers, including the architect and future Bauhaus bigwig Walter Gropius, which for Kokoschka was a source of constant jealousy. He painted this work known as The Tempest, Bride of the Wind, which depicted their relationship, Using predominantly cool grey-blue colours, it evokes little passion chromatically. Instead, its energy comes from its full-on violent expressionistic brushstrokes, which paint a scene of the couple at rest amidst a turbulent background that can be interpreted as them being borne aloft on a rising cloud, like a pair of expressionist angels, or it could be seen as the maw of a wave bearing down mercilessly on their reclining forms. Perhaps the ambiguity reflects the same onshore feeling Kokoschka had in their relationship, though one more certain element is the way he paints the figures themselves. Alma is depicted in flowing soft brushstrokes, at peace and resting by his side, while Kokoschka himself is a knot of tensile brushwork, his face turned upwards towards the heavens in a sullen contemplative mood. The touches of colour and complexity of brushwork throughout are in themselves quite beautiful, and the work is a prime example of the expressionist style. Though when it came to providing a psychological insight into his subjects, he was only about halfway there, as Alma was far from peaceful, as he was about to find out. Describing their romance as a whirlwind of emotions, she seems to have had conflicting feelings. Speaking of this work, Alma said, He painted me, lying trustingly against him in the midst of a storm and huge waves, relying utterly on him for help, while he, tyrannical in his expression and radiating energy, calms the waves. Kokoschka's characterization of her and their relationship in this work thus seems rather inaccurate, though we can hardly assume, for while we have many of his writings to and about her, Alma destroyed her own half of their correspondences, though she did keep a reproduction of The Tempest in her home. With the onset of World War I, the couple would go their separate ways, their relationship being taxed to breaking point when Alma became pregnant and chose to have an abortion without informing Kokoschka, a decision which wounded him deeply. Reeling in the depths of depression, Kokoschka was susceptible to the likely suicidal suggestion that he should volunteer at the outbreak of war. Thus, they would go their separate ways, 
With funds from the sale of the Tempest, he purchased a horse and joined the Austrian cavalry, while she would go on to marry Gropius. Kirkoshka's military career went about as well as you might expect for a man who brought a horse to a gunfight. The ridiculously 19th century cavalry were a poor fit for modern war and he was soon injured gravely, taking both a bayonet to the chest and a bullet to the head. He somehow managed to survive these near-fatal injuries, however, though the doctors who treated him were more concerned with his state of mind. Thinking him driven mad by the war, when in all likelihood he was probably like that when he got there, they sent him far from the front to recuperate in the home of one Dr. Hans Poss, a great admirer of the arts, who doubled as a museum curator and who interestingly enough, some years later, would moonlight as Hitler's private art collector. Under the care of Poss and his house servants, chiefly a young chambermaid named Hulda, who took quite a shine to him, though not being keen on the name Hulda, he would soon rechristen her as Rasurl, Kokoschka would recover from his wounds, though he was still haunted by his love for Alma, the loss of whom he felt more deeply than any bayonet to the chest. We can see this pain illustrated in this self-portrait, titled Knight Errant, in which Kokoschka casts himself, somewhat melodramatically, in the role of a medieval crusader, who lies wounded in a desolate wasteland far from home. While this in part refers to his experiences of war and disillusion with the romanticised fairy tales of it that the reality was so different from, the inclusion of a sphinx that bears suspicious similarities to Alma implies that the pain he feels is equally, if not more so, rooted in his loss of her, though in this case it is Kakoshka and not the sphinx that asks the questions. The letters ES above him are shorthand for Christ's exclamations on the cross of... Bear with me here. Eloi, Eloi, I am a Sabachthani, or my god, my god, why have you forsaken me? Quite dramatic stuff. Driven to despair by his unceasing attachment to Alma, he decided, in a move that even the most sentimental of poets would struggle to call romantic, that if he couldn't have her, he would instead have a semblance of her. To this end, he contacted one Hermine Moose, a painter and doll maker of some repute, with an unusual request to create a doll in the likeness of his former lover. God only knows what Hermine thought of this, or if she knew what she was letting herself in for, as soon she was being bombarded with letters from a very enthusiastic Kakoshka. Yesterday, I sent a life-sized drawing of my beloved, and I ask you to copy this most carefully and to transform it into reality. Pay special attention to the dimensions of the head and neck, to the ribcage and the rump, and the limbs and to take to heart the contours of the body, the line of the neck to the back, the curve of the belly. Please permit my sense of touch to take pleasure in those places where layers of fat or muscle suddenly give way to a sinewy covering of skin. It got weirder than that too, if that is indeed possible. He hounded her mind with letter after letter, with each request for further fidelity to life being more bizarre than the last. Can the mouth be opened? Are there teeth and a tongue inside? I hope so. When the day finally arrived for the doll's delivery, great expectations had been raised. Kakoshka and Rasurl waited eagerly, and when the crate containing the creation at long last arrived, they stood with bated breath as it was opened to reveal not the doppelganger they had hoped for, but a creature that would be more at home in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari than the home of Dr. Poss. As Kakoshka later recalled this moment, in a state of feverish anticipation, like Orpheus calling Eurydice back from the underworld, I freed the effigy of Alma Mahler from its packing. As I lifted it into the light of day, the image of her I had preserved in my memory stirred into life. Despite the brave face he put on things, it was quite obviously a long way from the real thing. He complained in a letter to Hermione that he couldn't even dress the damn thing thanks to the feathery covering, though his disappointment did not prevent him from making the best of the situation. He made a series of drawings and paintings of the doll, in various poses and manners, as if seeking to breathe life into it, and Rosero was dispatched to get the gossip mills going, telling the patients and friends of Poss that Kakoshka would bring the doll on horse carriage rides, pay for a seat for it at the opera, and of course, shared his bed with it. All helping to fuel the controversy, Kakoshka seemed once again eager to cultivate. Whatever it was that he had hoped to exercise from himself with this effigy of Alma, it seems to have done the trick, as after a period of some months cavorting with what he and Rosero came to call the Silent Woman, he decided that enough was enough, and he was freed from his attachment to Alma at last. To celebrate, he threw a party, invited all of his mates, and when everyone was good and drunk, he brought the doll into the street, 
decapitated it with a sword and poured wine all over the remains. The next morning, he found himself awoke by a knock at the door and two policemen, called to investigate the headless body and pools of blood the neighbours had reported. This incident, bizarre, strange and fraught with sexual complexes that not even Freud could dream up, has come to be somewhat legendary. Though I must advise you that some elements were no doubt embellished by Kakoshka, who was giving to doing so, and his accomplice Rosurl, who similarly delighted in spreading rumours that scandalised the good doctor's well-to-do houseguests. It's worth noting, however, that parts of the whole affair also seem to fit quite well with Kakoshka's artistic concerns overall, to the extent where we may even consider this entire episode to be an early incarnation of a kind of performance art, which in some ways seems to illustrate, or at the very least refer, to his conceptions of the vision and the functions of art. Consider, if you will, the nature of the act itself. Beyond the immediately creepy serial killer vibes of creating the doll, it was the semblance of Alma it provided that stirred his memory into life and allowed him to paint, which seems quite fitting considering Kokoschka's conceptions of the vision. We might also consider how he loved to shock his audiences, as we saw in his early works, and which this whole episode seems calculated to do so again. There is also an interesting element of the primitive to it too, in that Kokoschka, like many modernists, was fascinated by the art of so-called primitive cultures and its ritualistic and totemic functions, so different from the functions of art in Western society. In this regard, the doll becomes a kind of effigy, through which he can exorcise the emotions he found no outlet for in the bourgeois norms of his own times. Thus, he turned instead to a more primitive artistic act, one that offers the possibility of redemption. Then again, maybe it can all be explained by the fact that he had quite recently been shot in the head. Who can say? But there is definitely a lot more going on here than just some strange behaviour from a famously eccentric artist. Whatever the truth is, it's hard to say, but part of me wonders if Poss may have related the tale to Hitler years later, who perhaps had his biases confirmed by it about all this modern art and its so-called degenerate qualities. For Kokoschka, among all modern artists, would become the poster child for degenerate art. This status was assured by his activities in the years between World War I and II, which saw Kokoschka becoming ever more politically involved, and considering the character of those times, how could you not? With coups, revolts and sedition aplenty as the battle lines for round two of the apocalypse were gradually taking form, Kokoschka found himself weighing in on matters of politics and art ever more frequently. During the Cap Pooch, for example, he made a public statement decrying damage caused during the attempted coup to a Rubens painting, which he found deplorable, asking politely if the competing sides would mind taking their battle outside of town so as to preserve the defenseless artworks, a suggestion which was strongly rebuked by the artists George Gross and John Hartfield in what became known as the Kunstlump Affair. Gross and Hartfield quite rightly pointed out how stupid Kokoschka's request was, not just in feasibility, but in the face of the many lives already lost and the storm clouds gathering on the political horizon that the putsch represented. Incidentally, Gross may also have been wary of Kokoschka having once encountered him at a ball in Berlin, chewing on a bloody piece of bone from an ox, as you do. When the Nazis eventually rose to power, Kokoschka fled to Czechoslovakia, his father's native land, where he met his future wife, Olda, the daughter of a lawyer whose legal skills would come in quite handy securing him Czech citizenship as he tried to stay one step ahead of the fascist advance. They made their home for a time in Prague, where he painted fantastic views of the city from high vantage points, as well as many works in opposition to the Nazis, whom he quite rightly saw as a threat to his art. His famous Portrait of a Degenerate Artist, painted around this time, was an open declaration of defiance to the Nazis, who had included his works in their infamous Degenerate Artists exhibition. Degenerate am I, it seems to say, with folded arms and a chin a Habsburg would be proud of. Damn right I am, what are you going to do about it? The Nazis, for their part, made their intentions rather clear, which were to hang Kokoschka from the nearest lamppost as soon as they got their hands on him. Degenerate he may well have been, but a dope he was not, and behind all the bravado, this painting tells us that he knew his days in Europe were numbered. A small figure hidden in the background, which bears a similar pose to that of Adam in Masaccio's Expulsion from the Garden, shows that on some level, he knew he was about to go into exile once again. When Neville Chamberlain decided to appease Hitler rather than oppose him, Kokoschka saw the writing on the wall. He fled Czechoslovakia for England, with Olda and as much of his work as he could carry in tow, where he spent the rest of the war painting allegories, such as this one, entitled The Crab. Many of the unfinished works he brought with him ended up becoming anti-war allegories, he know it, and this one in particular was aimed right at Chamberlain, whom The Crab represents. 
because, you know, Chamberlain, crabs, that, that whole connection there. Meanwhile, the swimmer is both a self-portrait of Kokoschka himself and a representation of Czechoslovakia, under the looming threat of invasion. Struggling in the choppy waters, the crab, as Kokoschka said, would only have to hold out its claw to save him, and yet it sits there unmoved, like the ambivalent crustacean that it is. As tacked on as the allegory may be, this painting is truly wonderful. If I were to pick a top three paintings of crabs, this would no doubt be among them. There's a fantastic sculptural quality to the vermilion shell that lends it a sense of weight, and the oversized area it takes up lets us appreciate all the delicate observation that Kokoschka put into recording its crabby carapace. The brushwork that comprises not just the crab, but the swimmer, sea, cliffs and houses in the distance, scenes from his wartime home of Polpero in Cornwall, is also a masterclass in expressionist brushwork, showing the technical prowess Kokoschka had achieved. Not that he would have cared or even acknowledged his defeat though, for him, it was simply a means to an end, which during these years was criticizing the Nazis, the war, and just about everything else. The Red Egg, another piece from this era which depicts Hitler and Mussolini about to sit down for a nice chicken dinner, which in an unlikely turn of events has just flown the coop, leaving behind the compositional focal point of the aforementioned Red Egg, which once again symbolizes Czechoslovakia. Before we look at anything else though, the caricature style portraits of the two fascist leaders must be addressed as they dominate the entire picture, particularly Mussolini who takes up a full third of the canvas looking, as he so often did, like an Easter Island statue that's had too much to drink. Hitler meanwhile is depicted in mid-rant, whatever nonsense he's spewing is undercut by the paper soldier's hat he wears and the rat which is implied by its direction to have leapt from his mouth. Kokoschka obviously has no love for the Axis leaders, but they are not the only targets of his ire, the Allies are fair game as well. The line in the back represents England, its tail forming a pound sign which invokes the financial basis of the British Empire, while the cat lazing under the table is quite often interpreted as representing France. Neither of these fuzzy incarnations of monstrous colonial powers in this instance seem too bothered by the actions of Hitler and Mussolini, a criticism Kokoschka would frequently make. In Marianne Maqui, he once again vents his frustrations with the Allied powers in action, showing Churchill and Montgomery having a few pints with Marianne, the traditional personification of France, in no rush to the front lines. In Angelus, Alice in Wonderland, he depicts his hometown of Vienna burning. The three figures wearing German, English and French helmets are making the traditional gestures of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, in reference to those three great powers' refusal to acknowledge the horrors their war was inflicting. Meanwhile, they're flanked by a mother with her baby in a gas mask and Alice herself, bare arse naked, surrounded by barbed wire and smiling like an Egypt, as lost in Wonderland as the combatants themselves were. In Lorelei, named for a Rhineland's river spirit, we see more criticism of the English, in the form of Queen Victoria, who rides a shark to whom she is feeding sailors of various skin tones darker than her own, which is a fairly accurate summation of Britain's naval history as far as I know. In her hands, she holds an emerald frog, which Kokoschka said represents Ireland, for Ireland has no reptiles but frogs, which isn't exactly true. Sure, we have plenty of snakes of all varieties. Kokoschka by now was a staunch pacifist, his own first-hand experiences of war having put him right off the whole armed conflict thing, and he spared no one in these wartime allegories, though his protestations were quite ineffectual, as were all condemnations of the slaughter. He avoided the war, living far from the front in that remote Cornish village of Polpero, and following the breakout of what was euphemistically called peace in 1945, he was able to return to the glamorous world of international art, where he was hailed as one of the greats of Viennese Expressionism, despite his continued denial of being any such thing. From the post-war years until his death, he would continue to produce works, creating portraits and landscapes for wealthy patrons, working on theatrical productions, and producing writings on his life and theories of art. Despite being free of the threat the Nazis posed though, these later years weren't all sunshine and rainbows, as there was one final expulsion waiting for him this time from the world of avant-garde art itself. While he remained well regarded for his contributions to Expressionism, the post-war years would see Kokoschka sink into relative obscurity as the arts underwent some major changes. There was little appetite in those days for the particularly German Expressionist style and its preoccupations with death, misery and the horrors of war, which in the face of the largest mechanised slaughter in history now seemed either crass, a bit out of touch or perhaps too close to the bone and many other pre-war art styles faced similar problems. As the philosopher and anti-jazz weirdo Theodore Adorno so famously put it, there was a kind of brutality to writing poetry after Auschwitz. 
And so, artists would shift their perceptions away from the horrors of the outside world and towards new, ever more abstract and conceptual sources for their works. This shift away from the figurative and towards the abstract was fueled by some very material concerns in the post-war years as well. Paris, under Nazi occupation, had lost its status as capital of the art world to New York, where many of Europe's intelligentsia had fled to escape the war, including Alma Mahler, who was keeping busy hosting balls for the artistic emigres. Soon, despite the so-called peace, there was a new war brewing, the Cold War, and elements within the American establishment embraced the push towards abstraction, positioning the works of painters like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko as the antithesis of the Soviet realism that was dominant in the USSR. Finally, if all of that wasn't enough to put the final nail in the coffin of figurative painting in the West, there was also the emergence of mass media and the language of advertising, itself a product of Vienna in many ways, owing its roots to Freud and his advertising mogul nephew, Eddie Bernays, which came to dominate the cultural landscape, ensuring that when painters did return to the figurative, they frequently did so through the lens of pop culture, rather than direct observations of reality. To Kokoschka, all of this was anathema, as his understandings of art were still rooted in his conception of the vision, which, without a connection to the real world, was impossible to articulate. Thus, rather than change with the times, he would instead position himself as he had done so many times before, in opposition to prevailing tastes and wisdom, taking on the role of the knight errant one last time, as he declared himself the champion of figurative art in an age that sought to do away with it. This perhaps quixotic quest was met by the critics with scepticism and a general shrugging of their collective shoulders, as by this time, art had not only moved on from the considerations of Kokoschka and his generation, but there was also a reappraisal of his works underway in general. While he had made his name with his portraits of Viennese movers and shakers way back in the day, his subsequent works, from his cityscapes which straddle a line between Impressionism and Expressionism, to his anti-war allegories which were considered pretty heavy-handed to say the least, none of these subsequent works were judged by the critics as having any real significance or technical merit. It can hardly have escaped your notice if you've watched this far that Kokoschka was not exactly the most gifted of painters. Many of his works can be rough around the edges to say the least, his colours are frequently muddy, and his handling of paint, which often relied on thick heavy impasto effects, can occasionally descend into a legible mess. On top of this, the gift he did have for capturing a sense of his subject's souls, so eloquently displayed in those early portraits, is said to have dissipated all too soon, the bulk of the works that earned him his reputation being created in the span of just a few years from around 1911 to 1915. While these shortcomings were perhaps less noticeable during the Expressionist heyday he had helped to kick off, the decades since had made them all the more glaring, and critics like the artist Thomas Lawson would take this chance to really put the boot into him accusing Kokoschka and his expressionist stylings of relying more on effect than affect, pointing out how, especially in later works, he would often add flourishes of runny paint or thick brushwork, not because, as in his earlier works, it helped to convey his subject, but rather because it was what was expected of him. Even his theatrics and disposition to shock his audience were called into question, with critics like Lawson pointing out that this inclination, whether consciously or not, was never actually taken far enough to put his audience off. Instead, works like Murderer, Hope of a Woman, his proud declarations of degeneracy, or whatever the hell was going on with the whole doll thing, seem in retrospect to be calculating publicity stunts conceived to build a mythos, without ever going so far as to actually put his audience off. This criticism in particular became ever more glaring in the later years of the 20th century, when controversial artworks and artists who sought to truly outrage their audiences became ever more common, retrospectively making Kokoschka's antics seem almost quaint in comparison. The shift in critical consensus around Kokoschka is, of course, bigger than just the man himself, and represents only one part of a larger shift in the direction of art surrounding the role of painting and image making itself, in an era of ever more postmodern and conceptual art. As such, it is probably best left up to each of us ourselves to come to our own conclusions as to the value and merit of Kokoschka and his efforts, for as with much of the best art, it will be divisive, speaking to some and not to others. For my own two cents, whatever that's worth, I don't think Kokoschka was by any means a bad painter. There's a few dodgy ones here and there alright, as there are with any painter, but there's also the occasional flash of painterly brilliance too. I especially like his cityscapes, which Lawson harshly described as having the effect of making everywhere look the same. Ouch. To me, they're heaving fields of impasto lines and bird's eye views of modernity's most aberrant creations feel like a surveyor's description of the feeling of a modern metropolis, at once both overwhelming and detached. 
To his credit though, opinions, be they yours, mine, or those of the critics, meant little to Kakashka, and he stuck to his figurative guns right up to the end, with works like the Prometheus Triptych, a massive three-panel image that combines Greek mythology with Christian imagery in yet another allegory, one which warns against the dangers of further wars to come and identifies technology itself as their primal cause. Distinct from the fully abstract painting of the time, the figures in this work still bear the hallmarks of observation from life. From the four horsemen of the central panel, who are about to imminentize the Eshtacon all over a hillside of unsuspecting people, to Prometheus himself, whose theft of fire from the gods becomes a symbol of the technology, which Kokoschka casts as the root cause of this apocalyptic vision. There is also a sense of depth and perspective in each of the three scenes. Considered passé by the standards of the time, Kokoschka refuses to abandon it instead implying a kind of space through receding and reclining figures. Through its methods and its message, this work attacks the perceived wisdom of the day, that the war was behind us and that the new age, fueled by technological advances, will be better. Kakashka instead insists that war will come again, so long as we remain enthralled to the Promethean gift of technology. It's not all doom and gloom though, as he does offer us one final scene of possible hope and redemption, not through war or technology, but through maternal love instead showing Persephone being reunited with her mother Demeter, released from hell by Hades, whom Kakashka egotistically casts himself in the role of, as if he, or his era, which he may be taken to represent, is giving permission for a more loving solution to the problems at hand. Works like this, and many of his later ones, would, however, have little impact, though in the end, Kakashka would preserve his vision of art in a rather different way, through one facet of his practice that is frequently overlooked in accounts of his work. It wasn't his paintings or his plays, not his writings or his various theatrical stunts. The most vital way he would champion his vision of art would be through his teaching instead. From his youth to his old age, Kokoschka had frequently supported himself by teaching. Inspired by his love of the Czech humanist and educator John Amos Comenius, whose works his father had introduced him to as a boy, he had come to see education as vital for creating a better world, and he taught thousands of students, children and adults, amateurs and professionals, everywhere he went. His teaching style is often said by those who studied under him to have been rather unusual, of course, being described in such various terms as flamboyant to messianic. Classes with Kakoshka were apparently something to behold. He's said to have had something of a gift for commanding the room, telling stories and demonstrating methods in his own unique way, which centred on teaching his students not simply technical skills, but much more importantly, how to see instead. A favoured method of his to do this was to cover his students' eyes with his hands, and, upon removing them, instructing the no doubt confused and befuddled student to paint exactly what they saw in that instance of revealing. Not the details, but the totality of the vision. His theatrics, of course, are present here too. He once instructed a model to fake a heart attack during a class, and then told the shocked students to paint his collapsed form. Another student, Philip Moisey, a professional painter whose work Kokoschka felt suffered from being perhaps too commercial, was instructed to throw his paints into the sea before Kokoschka would even begin to teach him, a request to which he acquiesced no doubt to the detriment of all nearby marine life. Crucially, Kokoschka was not concerned with the talent or status of his students, he would teach anyone who wished to learn. He was even responsible for setting up the School of Seeing, as he called it, in Salzburg, which charged no fees and held no entry requirements, where he would teach all comers regardless of ability. The school is still in operation today, and although now it does have some entry requirements due to the sheer volume of applicants, its spirit remains intact by allowing tutors to select students they feel will benefit, rather than just those who can pay, and still running some classes that remain open to all. It was, in the end, as a teacher, not a painter, that Kokoschka was able to pass on the knowledge and ideas he had formed over his long life by showing future generations that the most important skill an artist has is their ability to see, to feel, and to connect to the world around them. Kokoschka's long career finally came to an end in 1980, when he passed away at the age of 93, a staggeringly long way from the Vienna of his youth. As a product of the fin de siècle era, like Klimt and Sheila before him, Kokoschka's works offer us something that we couldn't get from either his one-time master or his painterly sibling, whom, incidentally, he was no fan of, both of whom having died in 1918. Kokoschka, by contrast, survived the majority of the 20th century, seeing much of its changes and its cruelties firsthand, and carrying the torch of Vienna's artistic revolutions forwards for future generations. His works, which chart a course of immense change for the arts, some of which he was responsible for and some of which he ended up resisting, offer us a window into the influence of Vienna on the course of 20th century art, and how over that long and complex century, those advances would themselves come to be challenged and supplanted, for things were very different by the time Kokoschka drew his final breath, 
in what was no longer the world of Franz Joseph and Sigmund Freud, as Robert Hughes so saliently observed, but the world of Reagan and Thatcher. <laughs>